One minute they were on the top of the world, and in the next, they had disappeared from the face of the earth. Believe it or not, even the most attention-grabbing celebrities can pull off a successful vanishing act. Join us as we break down the stories of celebrities who vanished and are still missing today. Number 7. Richie Edward It was January 23, 1995, when Richie Edwards gave his last interview to a Japanese music magazine, Music Life. The singer-slash-songwriter was high on the remarkable wave of his band's success with their quintessential cult classic album, The Holy Bible. It was Manic Street Preacher's third album, and well, anyone who knows the band would say that The Holy Bible was laced with a striking intellectual lyricism. It isn't surprising that it was Richie who wrote 80% of the album. According to his band members, Richie was obsessed with reading literature and academic sources before getting into the writing process for the album. Perhaps this is why the album was rich with fresh, intelligent literary references and intellectual commentary on the issues that had grappled with human civilization. At the same time, the Holy Bible had dark undertones that were filtered through Ritchie's bleak academic lens. Themes like self-harm, prostitution, anorexia, the Holocaust, and the depravity of human conditions are persistent in the Holy Bible. For the members of Manic Street Preachers, the brilliant prose-like lyricism from Ritchie didn't raise any alarms until he went missing. Prior to the tragic incident, they had assumed that Edward's indulgence in dark content was more of a journalistic pursuit than a cry for help. The singer and his cousin slash bandmate, James Dean Bradfield, were supposed to fly to America for their promotional tour of the Holy Bible on February 1, 1995. But Ritchie was missing from his hotel room in London. More than two weeks later, his car was found in the Severn View service station after it was reported as an abandoned vehicle. The police found the car's battery to be dead, suggesting some Someone had lived inside it for hours. Upon investigation, the police found the pictures of Richie's family inside the car that he had taken himself. Since the car was found very close to the Severin Bridge, a known suicide spot, it is speculated that Richie had jumped off the bridge. However, the police were unable to find a dead body. The other theory about Edward's disappearance suggests that he simply faked his death to find refuge in the world of music. In the weeks leading to his disappearance, the singer had withdrawn 200 pounds from his bank account to supposedly buy a desk from Cardiff. However, there was no track record of a desk ever being ordered or delivered to Richie's place. But that wasn't the most bizarre part about Richie's disappearance. Before the events of February 1st, the singer had given his close friend the infamous novel with cocaine with the recommendation to closely read the introduction of the book. In that particular portion of the book, the author details his experience of spending time in an asylum to fix mental anguish before disappearing forever. The police took the book as an indication that Richie was planning his disappearance for months. After all, before the vanishing act, he had put his favorite books and valuables in a box and had them delivered to his on and off girlfriend, Joe. Seven days after his disappearance, a taxi driver allegedly picked up Richie from the King's Hotel and drove him around the area, including Blackwood, which was the singer's hometown. Eventually, the taxi driver drove him to Pontypool train station and then later to the Severn View service station. It is unclear how the singer's car got to the same spot as the police vouched for his trip with the taxi driver. Another incident that tipped off the police was Richie's appearance in the Newport Passport Office, as well as the Newport bus station. There, he even stopped to meet and greet a fan as they had a mutual friend in Laurie Fiddler. The fan had no idea that when he met with the singer, the police had declared him as a missing person. It is also reported that the police's investigation into the matter was super lousy, as they didn't factor in Richie's mental state. In fact, it took them two years to actually evaluate the closed-circuit television footage that they had found from the hotel's lobby. Perhaps the police were counting on the singer to reappear by himself, making his disappearance nothing but a publicity stunt. And to be fair, the singer had a knack for garnering media's attention in weird ways. In one notorious incident, he had carved for real on his arm in front using a razor blade. Richie's family resisted declaring him presumably dead for years, but in 2008, the family took the hard decision and swallowed the pill. Even then, they hoped that Richie Edwards would come home almost 30 years after his vanishing act. Since the singer's much-speculated disappearance, he has been reportedly seen in a market in Goa and the islands of Fuerteventura and Lanzarote, located in the Spanish territory. None of these sightings were ever officially verified by the police. Number 6. Connie Converse 
Years before Bob Dylan cracked open the success formula for modern music, it was actually Connie Converse who should have made it big in the world of music. But the singer-slash-songwriter was making music in the 1950s when her ethereal lyrics and unconventional style had no place. Often cited as the precursor to Bob Dylan, Connie was way ahead of her time. Converse was trying to make modern, non-contextual music in the times when record labels were focusing on something else entirely. So, the singer had assumed herself to be a unique entry point for the music executives who would ideally want a fresh voice and lyricist in the market. Much to Converse's disappointment, that didn't happen. Every time she met up with a record label, she was rejected for her atypical style that wouldn't have persuaded her audience. Even then, Connie gave the music industry her blood, sweat, and tears for more than a decade in the hopes of finding her breakout act. However, that didn't happen. For someone as revolutionary as Converse, her audiences were limited to the confines of their living rooms and salons. Towards the end of her career, Connie had a very small fan base that didn't reflect the singer-songwriter's creative mastery. Disappointed, she quit making music towards the 1960s and moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan to live with her brother Philip. It was said that Converse had grown tired of the fast life of New York City, and every time she stepped out, she was forced to interact with the very place that had refused to embrace her, and by extension, her music. Not to mention, it was around the same time when Bob Dylan had moved to Greenwich Village and had acquired a quick mainstream success for the same singer-songwriter formula that Connie had put forward. In Ann Arbor, the singer began to work as a writer and managing editor for the Journal of Conflict Resolution. At the same time, she became a staunch activist against racism and capitalism. Connie had found a new life for herself, but she never really got over her failed musical career. To make matters worse, her beloved journal was auctioned off to Yale, and Connie Converse was left without a job. That event marked Connie's dissatisfaction with her life and a hard-hitting depression that eventually led to her disappearance. By 1973, Converse had grown profoundly restless about the prospect of her future. Her friends even gathered money to fund her six-month leisure trip to England, hoping that a change in scenery would uplift her spirits. Yet their friend barely got better. Back home, her mother insisted she accompany the family on their annual trip to Alaska. But once again, the trip had gone so horribly wrong for the former singer that she began began to conjure her vanishing act right there and then. In the days leading up to her departure from her home, she wrote several letters to her friends and family, talking about her plans to give New York City another try. At the same time, Converse had received tragic news from her doctors. She promptly needed a hysterectomy to save her life. Knowing that she was sick, she mailed her brother a check to pay off her health insurance alongside his letter. However, Philip revealed that according to his sister's instructions, he was supposed to stop paying for her insurance on a certain date. When the Converse family was on their annual lake trip, Connie packed her bags, loaded them into her Volkswagen Beetle, and left the town. Since then, no one has heard from her. Years later, Philip did find a small lead in an effort to locate his sister. Phone books from either Oklahoma or Kansas featured a new contact for a person named Elizabeth Converse. However, nothing came out of the lead. The Converse family also hired a private investigator to search for Connie a decade later after her disappearance. Perhaps they had found a lead that they thought was worth pursuing, but that effort also proved to be futile because the private investigator wanted to respect Connie's right to disappear. Finally, her family also began to respect her decision to start a new life and halted all efforts to look for her. It is also generally believed that Connie took her life. If she's alive today, she's about to be a hundred years old. Given her history of medical issues, it's also probable that she could have died of natural causes, but her family hopes that she's aware of the posthumous success and recognition her music has gotten after a radio channel randomly began to play her songs from decades ago. In 2009, a compilation of Connie's unreleased songs songs called How Sad, How Lovely was released to the public and went on to earn critical acclaim, better late than never, right? Number 5. Jim Sullivan in 1975, Jim Sullivan was en route to Nashville when he was forced to check into a motel in Santa Rosa. His journey was so long and tiring that Sullivan's car was swerving and he was clearly fumbling behind the wheel. The cop stopped him for his erratic driving and took him to the station to question him. Deemed sober, he was let go but the police ordered him to get some sleep in a motel nearby. So, he decided to make a pit stop to gather his spirits. It wasn't surprising that he was shortly seen buying himself a bottle of vodka. And then he was never seen again. Rumor has it that he was abducted by the aliens. Jim Sullivan was never able to make it big in the world of music. His most notable piece of work was his debut album, UFO. 
which only garnered marginal success at the time of its release in 1969, so much so that it went out of print very quickly. Yet little did the artist know that his album would make a massive comeback and will become one of the most sought-after rarities in the vinyl collecting culture. Thematically, the album is unconventional, mystical, and even downright weird. Perhaps this is why Jim found it extremely hard to find mainstream success. He was ahead of his times in making music that didn't adhere to the conventionalities of romance or sadness. In his album, UFO, he talked about abandoned highways, aliens making their cryptic visits, a ghost town in Arizona, and a man who had embodied death so closely that it was understandable for him to die. Yeah, no one was buying the album. Sullivan himself posed a certain mystic and laid-back persona that was out of character for musicians of his time. Even though Jim's music has found critical acknowledgement today, it has simultaneously added peculiarities to his vanishing act too. Six years after making the UFO, then 35-year Sullivan vanished from the face of Earth in Santa Rosa. When his car was finally recovered, he had left the three things he held dear and important to him in the front seat. His identity card, his beloved 12-string guild guitar, and box two containing two of his albums, UFO and the 1972 long play, Jim Sullivan. The singer's car was found at a ranch 26 miles away from the motel. But the Gennetti family who owned the ranch didn't see Jim coming in or leaving his car. What really made the Sullivan family extremely suspicious was the fact that Gennetti left the town soon after the singer's disappearance. There was no apparent reason behind the move, but the family sold off their ranch and moved to Hawaii to start a new life. Shortly afterward, the sheriff involved in the investigation decided to retire too. The reason behind his decision remains unknown. Now, the retirement could have been a massive coincidence, but Gennady's leaving the town in a hurry made little sense. After all, one of the family members was the last person to have a chat with Sullivan without realizing that the cowboy-looking stranger had abandoned his car at the ranch. Involved in a crime that took Jim's life? Well, no one knows. Not to mention, the police didn't make much of Jim's erratic driving when he was first stopped at Santa Rosa. Since he was completely sober, it was bizarre that he was being reckless behind the wheel. Now, it is speculated speculated that he was having a mental episode of some sort, which ultimately caused him to take his own life. Prior to his disappearance, Jim had an idle conversation with his former manager about how they would pull off their vanishing act. Shockingly, the singer had talked about simply walking into the desert and never looking back if he truly wanted to disappear from the face of the earth. The fact that he was not too far away from the desert on an unfortunate night added fuel to this working theory. Disappointed by the efforts made by the police, Sullivan's two brothers made it to the police to carry out their investigation, but couldn't find any reasonable leads. So far, the working theory about Sullivan's disappearance is all about the mystic singer's fascination with aliens, who allegedly kidnapped him too. Number 4. Rico Harris Rico Harris was a talented hooper since his high school years and was considered to be a strong college prospect. But a series of unfortunate events led to his tragic career demise. Harris began his basketball college career at Arizona State University, but couldn't hold his ground. He soon ran into trouble with the law as he was arrested for unlawful imprisonment. There's not much known about the arrest that resulted in no charge. According to The Grunge, Rico soon returned to a school much closer to his home where he led the Los Angeles City College team to its first state championship before transferring again to Cal State Northridge. While he didn't have a National Basketball Association shout soon, he was playing for the popular Harlem Globetrotters. However, he was forced to leave Globetrotters within a month after an assault left him with life-threatening head injuries. In 2000, Rico returned home and resorted to drugs and alcohol. It took him several years to put his life on track. By 2014, he got a job, found sobriety, and moved to Seattle with his girlfriend Jennifer Song, who was also the last person to hear from the former Hooper. According to Song, one day Rico turbulently decided to visit Los Angeles to sort out some family issues. After making an 18-hour drive, he got to the city, met his family, and had dinner with them. But for some reason, he decided to leave for Seattle on the very same day. Seven hours into the tiring journey, he stopped at a gas station and also called his girlfriend to give her updates about his trip. On the phone, he told Song that he had been up for 36 hours. His girlfriend had advised him to take some rest before continuing to drive, but he ignored her requests. A few hours later, he left Song a cryptic voicemail saying that he was heading for the mountains, and then he vanished. 
When Rico didn't reach home and his phone was out of reach, his family and girlfriend approached the police who were very prompt in their investigation. Harris's car was found in the parking lot of a park in Northern California's Yolo County. The car's location was extremely suspicious because Yolo County was miles away from the direct route that goes to Seattle from Los Angeles. The car had been clearly ransacked, was out of gas, and the battery was dead. It seemed like someone drove the car to the maximum distance before it ran out of gas. Shockingly, Rico's phone was pinged 70 miles away from the car's location. Soon enough, police received a tip about a backpack and a cell phone that presumably belonged to the missing Hooper. The acquired phone revealed something bizarre about the incident. It seemed like Rico had recorded himself trashing his car. It was still unclear how the car had gotten to Yolo County in the first place. A lot of people had seen Harris in the vicinity where he went missing, but none of the leads were strong enough to pinpoint where the Hooper must have been. Even today, Rico's family and his girlfriend are striving to keep his missing person's case alive. Number 3. Scott Smith Formed in 1979, the Canadian rock band wouldn't become one of the biggest acts in the genre. Sure, their hit singles such as Turn Me Loose and Working for the Weekend are still heard on radio stations across Canada and America. Yet Loverboy would earn notoriety for something else entirely, the disappearance of their long-term bassist, Scott Smith. As the story goes, the band was taking a weekend to relax after doing a charity concert for juvenile diabetic patients in 2000. The performance was a hit, and Smith, who was an avid sailor, wanted to test the waters again with his friend and former bandmate, Bill Eilis. Since the bassist already had a plan to spend the winters with his girlfriend, Yvonne Mayotte, in Los Angeles, the trio decided to sail to their destination. It was Scott who was steering the 37-foot sailboat. No one batted an eye because it was customary for him to do so. The journey was proving itself to be extremely difficult, though. The winds were turbulent, the waves were sky-high, and the atmosphere was pretty foggy. It was becoming increasingly difficult for Scott to sail the boat, but he carried on, and in one unfortunate minute, he was gone. Both Bill and Yvonne were down the deck when a 25-foot wave knocked over the boat from its side. The wave was so powerful that the steering wheel was completely detached from the boat. Even though the Coast Guards arrived within 10 minutes of the incident, there was no trace of Scott. Both Bill and Yvonne were struggling too, but they still made an attempt to look for Scott to no avail. The rescue efforts continued for more than a day. In the meantime, Bill, joined by Scott's friends and family, also started a private struggle to look for the missing bassist. Yet the efforts proved futile. Eventually, they had to accept the inevitable. Scott was gone forever. The band's manager ultimately informed the world about the tragic demise of the bassist in the following words. We have to confirm what we already believe in our hearts, which we don't want to believe. We're looking for anything we can hang our hearts on. For Yvonne and Bill, the accident was even more traumatic. They couldn't believe that Scott had disappeared in the vastness of the sea in a mere second. Number 2. Jim Thompson James Harrison Wilson Thompson wasn't an ordinary businessman. After serving in the American military, he wanted to test his luck in entrepreneurship. And well, the decision worked like a charm. Thompson's silk business took off in Thailand and quickly became a prominent figure in revitalizing the Thai silk venture in the 1950s and 60s. In fact, According to the Times, Jim's business had single-handedly saved the iconic Thai silk business from ultimate extinction. Across all economic circles, Thompson was being hailed as this revolutionary mind who was the savior of an important aspect of Thai industries. And then one day, he went missing. There's no doubt that the businessman had made quite a few enemies of his own. He had embarked on a business venture that several people had tried and tested before, but couldn't get even an inch of success. Not to mention, Jim was an American who had tapped into an extremely competitive Thai market where locals were struggling constantly. So it's highly probable that Thompson had several business rivals who wanted him gone or worse, dead. But the bizarreness of the businessman's disappearance doesn't do much to prove this theory whatsoever. If anything, it seems like Thompson himself walked into the abyss of nothingness and didn't look back. After all, he didn't go missing from Thailand. If there's some bad faith and evil involved in the vanishing of Jim Thompson, it was initiated in Malaysia. In 1967, Jim traveled to Malaysia for a short trip with his friends. Since he had a bungalow there, he invited his friends to stay in the Moonlight Mansion, which was well furnished. Yet back in his leisure town, Thompson began to act strangely. 
While the group had an itinerary, their companion would take small breaks to take a walk into the wilderness. He wouldn't go for long, but he was frequently stepping away from the group for periods as short as 20 minutes. On one faithful Sunday, Thompson and his friends attended the All Souls Church for its Easter service. After spending an hour in the church, the group returned to Moonlight where they had lunch. Everything seemed fine and typical, but once again Jim insisted on having an afternoon stroll. True to his words, he made his way to the only access road surrounding the bungalow, Jalan Kamunting. Hours went by, but Thompson never made it back home. His disappearance was a firestorm of news in Malaysia's Cameron Highlands. This is why, alongside the Malay police and military, more than 500 locals and American students joined the search party to look for the business. The search continued for 11 days, but nothing was found of Jim Thompson. The most probable theory was that perhaps the businessman had run into the wild where he became prey for blood-hungry animals, but that theory was later dismissed as no blood or remains were found. Back then, cars were not common in the area either, so there was a very low chance that Thompson purchased a vehicle to make his run, and well, that didn't seem logical either. Why would a successful businessman who was doing well financially escape? Nothing about a deliberate vanishing act made sense, except for one theory that had everything about Jim Thompson's side hustle. You see, the businessman was an ardent member of the American Office of Strategic Services. If you don't know anything about this coveted department, you might know something about its notorious successor, the Central Intelligence Agency. Yep, Thompson was secretly working for the American government, it is unclear what exactly was his role and if his business venture was a mere cover. However, it is speculated that he had grown sympathetic toward the American communists who were fighting against their country's decision to fight a brutal war in Vietnam. However, since the American government lent resources to search for Thompson, the theory of him being a traitor is weak. Sources close to the businessman also believe that he perhaps went for a secret operation in Vietnam and then went into a strict program similar to witness protection. Number 1. Barbara Newhall Follett The House Without Windows was one of the most critically acclaimed novels that were written in the late 1920s. Believe it or not, its author was 12-year-old Barbara Newhall Follett, who would tell another successful story two years later. The Voyage of Norman D. was considered to be the author's most defining work. She would continue to write in the subsequent years, but it was her romantic relationship and eventual marriage with Nickerson Rogers that slowed her down. Anything that she wrote during her marriage didn't settle well with the publishing houses. It seemed like Follett had lost her charm. And well, it didn't have to do anything with her authoring prowess. From the letters that Barbara had written to her close friends, the police were able to figure out that the author was extremely unhappy in her marriage. The sadness that came with a dying love affair took away the joy of writing. It was also discovered that Nickerson had been unfaithful to her multiple times. By 1938, Barbara had told her friends that she was depressed. One day, she had a turbulent quarrel with her husband. With only $30 in her pocket, she stepped out of her house and was never to be seen again. It could have been another mysterious case of a person gone missing, but it took Nickerson more than two weeks to inform the police that his wife hadn't returned home. He had simply assumed that Barbara was crashing with a friend and that she would come back eventually. The author's family didn't believe Nickerson's motivations, who is largely believed to be the perpetrator behind his wife's disappearance. After all, Rogers didn't show considerable effort to look for his wife. He published the missing person bulletin four months later and only used Barbara's married last name when she was known by her maiden name. Tragically, Barbara was declared dead and her body was never recovered. Thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.